Hey, Joe. Hey, Kate. Hey, Rosalie. Hello, hello, hello. There he is. Oh, I gotta do that. <laughs> yeah. Good to see you. Same here, same here. Wow, I'm really excited about having you here talking about integrating computer science. That's cool. It is a and pleasure. I think what we'll do is we'll let, let's wait a, about a one sure. minute or so, and then uh, totally. Let me uh, read a little bit of a bio for you. Works for me. Do you, uh, you want to, uh, the uh, attendees to hold questions to the end, right? No, I, I'm I'm perfect. If, if people want to jump straight into questions, I'm totally cool with that. Um, cool. Cool. In my experience with Hop, the Hopin platform, sometimes questions go to Q and A. Sometimes they go to chat. So I might lean on you to to keep an yeah. eye on them to let me know. Um, yeah. yeah. Most most of the time, I can answer questions in flight, and if not, I'll just say, "Hey, hold that," and yeah. I'll get to it at the end. Good. Good. Um, Lisa's here. Why don't we, yeah, yeah. Why don't we? Um, we've got eleven. Looks like eleven people here. Um, maybe we should get started. So, sure. Let me see if I can share. Uh, let, let me uh, try to sort out the tech ish, the tech stuff, uh, as a way of oh. buying us an extra minute. Let okay. me just confirm that everything is going to work the way you want it to work. Um, Share screen, window, great okay. All right, is that, can you see that? Yes, yes. So um, this is the session, uh, don't just add coding, the promise and challenge of integrated computer science. Um, our speaker, Emmanuel Schanzer, is the founder and co-director of Bootstrap, which builds research-based curricular models that help teachers integrate computer science into mainstream classes like history, science, and math. He has spent uh, he spent several years as a program manager and developer before becoming a public high school teacher, yay, and uh, middle school academic coach in Boston. Uh, he has long been involved in connecting uh, educators and technology at CSTA, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and at universities across the country. He holds degrees in computer science and curriculum development. Uh, and completed his doctoral studies at Harvard with a research focus on using programming to teach algebra. Uh, I've personally attended uh, one of his all-day workshops and several of his other sessions at various conferences. I've always found Emmanuel interesting, enlightening, thought-provoking, and really, really a nice guy. So take it away, Emmanuel. That's very sweet, Joe. When, whenever somebody from the, the Midwest calls me nice, that means I know I'm doing something right. So I, I appreciate that. Um, well, hey, everybody. So I will do my best to live up to that wonderful introduction. Um, as Joe mentioned, you know, I have a background in computer science, but really I self-identify as an educator. So you know, I, one of my undergrad degrees was in education. I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. I was a public school teacher uh, for six years in Boston, Massachusetts. And I think just in my heart, teaching is where, where I'm at. Um, so for those who, who you know, maybe may not be familiar with Bootstrap, I wanted to give a brief introduction to just sort of where I'm coming from, why I'm the guy leading this session. Um, but really, this talk is not about Bootstrap. It's about, you know, the, the importance of integrated computer science and why, if it's such a good idea, people have struggled to do it over the last few decades, because it's actually harder than people think. Um, just as a logistical note, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them um, in the chat box. I know in Hopin, there's both chat and Q&A. Personally, I have a hard time running slides, talking, and monitoring both of those. So it's easier for me just to like sit on one. So um, if you have a question, feel free to ask it in the chat, and I will do my best to answer it in real time. OK, so let's begin. Um, as I mentioned, I'm from an organization called Bootstrap. and for those who may not be familiar with us, we've been around for a while. Um, in fact, in this business where everything moves so fast, the fact that we are 15 years old makes us like one of one of the, uh, the elders of CS education. Um, and 15 years ago, everybody was talking about, you know, rah, rah, computer science for all, yay, computer science. And we made a fairly controversial bet. So first we said, maybe siloed computer science classes aren't the only way to do this. Um, second, 
maybe there's a way to integrate computing and math authentically. And third, maybe there's a way to do this equitably. So it's available for all students. In other words, we're not gonna create like a coding and math elective that some kids opt into and some kids don't. We wanna see if we can make this fit in a mainstream math class taught by a teacher with no computing background so it works for everybody. So fast forward 15 years later, we are one of the largest providers of in-school K-12 CS nationwide. I would argue we're probably the largest integrated provider. Um, if you want to you know, apply to the NSF to write a curriculum for computer science in middle or high school, um, we're very honored that the NSF says, uh, we, you, know, you might want to take a look at these, these three, and Bootstrap is one of them. Um, and while we're proud of being big, what we're most excited about is our diversity. 43% of Bootstrap students are girls and young women, 46% are black and brown students, and that's because we're working with the teachers that already reach every child. So of the 30,000 plus students that we reach every single year, almost all of them are in non-CS classes taught by teachers with no CS background. And we've, you know, we offer classes in everything, as Joe mentioned, from math to physics, you know, other sciences, social studies, history, and so on in grades five through 12. So, you know, that's why I'm giving this talk, right? That like we've been able to pull this off in a way that, you know, ever since 1960, people have sort of struggled to do. So why? Well, I want to give you an example of, of a dialogue that I see happening all the time. <clears throat> I think since many of you here are computer science folks, um, I want to give you sort of an audience participation. So please write your answer in the chat. Um, I know the slide says a history teacher. Um, in fact, yeah, let's just start with that. The history teacher walks into your office and says, oh, you're the computer science person. I really want to you know, integrate some coding. What should I use? So quick, what's your answer? What do you tell that teacher? You guys are the experts. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, so Amanda says, uh, how about Scratch? Yep, yeah, that's a that's a common answer, absolutely. Any other suggestions? Joe says Scratch, here we go. <coughs> um, um, aha, Paul, Rachel, Eldred, what do you want to accomplish? What's your goal? What are your learning outcomes? Aha, fantastic. Yeah, so uh, I, I took some, some screenshots of an actual Facebook thread about this. Um, and so this person, um, uh, Divya posted and said, you know, I want some advice on coding. I want to teach it to fifth graders. What should I do? And indeed, uh, I think uh, those of you who said Scratch, you're in good company. Scratch was the immediate answer. Um, other folks said, no, no, you know, logo, actually Legos. Um, someone else says, you know, um, maybe, um, maybe anything like about games would be good, right? So this is a pretty common answer. Now, of course, there's a problem here, right? Which is if, if instead of it being a history teacher, it was just your neighbor and they said, my kid wants to build an app, what, like, what, what tools should I teach them? I think all of us would ask questions that are a little bit more like Paul, Rachel, and Eldritch. We'd say, well, it depends. What kind of app is it, right? Like, if it's a game, uh, chances are HTML, not, the, not a great programming language to use. Or if it's a database, Java, you know, Python, probably not the best language to use. So often in our line of work, when someone has a programming task, we immediately have questions about what are you trying to accomplish? But whenever it's something that isn't a programming task, typically the answer is, here's my favorite tool, right? It's Scratch, it's Python, it's Java, it's whatever. And I think that's one of the reasons that integration generally hasn't worked so well. So um, if you wanna plug computer science into other courses, you gotta start asking questions, right? Like how old are the kids? Have they had any CS exposure before? Is your class a required class or, or is it an elective? How long is it, right? Is it, is it like block schedule? Is it just 30 minutes after school, um, right? Like maybe it's not even a class. How many kids are in the classroom? Do they have internet access? Do, has the teacher programmed before? Can the kids even type, right? So for those of you who suggested Scratch, I, I just wanna be clear, I love Scratch. Scratch is awesome. And if kids can't type, then yeah, we probably should be recommending some sort of block-based program. Um, are there students with disabilities? And if so, you know, wh what are they? 
Um, do the students have computer access at home or even at school, right? Like maybe it's the kind of school where you get a laptop cart once a week. So all of these are questions that we should be asking before we even give teachers an answer of what they should use. Rachel says in the chat, there's so many factors to think about. Absolutely. And so, you know, this is just a short list, but I, I want, you know, if you're, if you're curious, I'd love to give you all a homework assignment, which is just to hang out on the CS Education Facebook group. It's got thousands of members. And pretty frequently, somebody asks a question, I want to use coding in my class. What should I use? And I would say probably eight out of 10 times, all of the comments are just tools. Use this tool, use that tool. I like this, I like that. Nobody asks any of these questions about these factors or constraints. So where is this, this blind enthusiasm coming from? Because look, I love blind enthusiasm. I think it's great, but like, why is this so pervasive? And you know, I think a lot of this comes from this phrase, computational thinking. So computational thinking was a, a big buzzword about 10 years ago. Um, the wave has crested and it's not quite as popular a buzzword as it used to be, but people still toss it around all the time. What the heck is computational thinking? Um, Joe said that sometimes I can be thought provoking. So I'm just gonna make a very controversial statement, which is that computational thinking is a useless, meaningless definition. As far as I can tell, it literally means whatever you want it to mean. I've had people tell me, you know, if you put your socks on before your shoes, that's algorithms. And like, I, I don't know, I've taken algorithms, I've taught algorithms, that's not an algorithm. Um, so I think there's this, this sort of blind idea that computational thinking is somehow universal. Now, there's actually a huge amount of research on a particular phenomenon that could prove or disprove this computational thinking claim. And the phenomenon is called transfer. So I don't know if any of you in the chat have heard of transfer. It's a term from cognitive science. If you're interested in a really enjoyable, like not academic, not dry read, um, I highly recommend um, Playing the Whole Game by David Perkins. So transfer, the phenomenon of transfer seems pretty straightforward. The idea is you can learn a skill or a concept in one domain and then apply it in a separate domain. And there's near transfer and far transfer. So for example, you know, when a kid first learns to tie their shoes, you know, and then later they, they have to tie the laces on boots. It's not, it's not an automatic assumption that every kid will instantaneously realize, oh, it's the same as tying a shoe. Um, most of them do, and that's an, an example of near transfer. Far transfer is something like, I don't know, like um, uh, learning programming in Python will help you learn something in math. Um, that's pretty far transfer. Uh, Rachel, I think that's a hand raised. Do you wanna chime in here with a, a question or comment? I guess not. Uh, she says, we know from brain science that the brain is malleable and can learn new things all the time and connections are made. Yes, absolutely. And here's, here's the rub. Transfer happens all the time, right? We are, humans are pattern matchers. We are constantly forming connections. The problem is most of those connections are wrong right? And there's essentially like a process of, of um, evolution, right? Which is that we form thousands of connections and the ones that are right over time get proven and they stick, right? You're like, oh, I learned that doing this particular thing worked, so I guess it must be a thing. But we make wrong connections all the time and that's okay. But that makes life really hard for teachers. And I am sure all of us in this room have had experiences where we taught a kid, we taught kids a particular concept we gave them like a quiz where we're evaluating that concept across a couple of questions. And some kids raise their hand and they're just like, you didn't tell us this, you didn't teach us that. And we're thinking to ourselves, what are you talking about? Of course I did. Has that happened to any of you where kids complain, you didn't teach us this thing? Um, there's a great example of a physics teacher. Um, this is actually in the book, the Perkins book, who spent a week teaching his students about acceleration due to gravity. And so he, he talked about dropping a penny off the Eiffel Tower, um, dropping a marble off the Empire State Building, the whole thing. And kids were you know, learning the equations for, for acceleration and velocity over time, the whole deal. And he gives them a quiz. 
And they all bomb one question on the quiz and they all complain. They say, this isn't fair. And the question was about something falling down an oil well. And the complaint was, you taught us tower problems, but you didn't teach us any, any hole problems, right? So that's an example of, of near transfer failing, right? The kids didn't, they didn't know enough to realize that structurally these are the same problems. So if, if just doing that in physics is hard, right? One physics concept to another physics concept, imagine the challenge of computer science. <coughs> so the idea that everyone who, you know, is all about compu computational thinking, the claim is, Learning something in task A will help them do better at it in task B. But really the way it works is, um, if there we go, um, we're trying to build up some kind of notional machine, right? We want, ki we want kids to learn something in task A, which in turn gives them like this abstract idea. That's like, oh, I know what this is. And then when they see that same abstract idea in task B, they can apply what they've learned. So that's, that's really the phenomenon we're trying to create. But transfer is hard. So let me give you an example. So ever since Seymour Papert said so in 1960, everybody has sort of believed that, you know, computer science and math are like best buddies. They're, or at the very least, they're, they're long lost cousins. And so surely if there's any class that we should be able to integrate computing into, it's math. This should be a slam dunk. So let's use this phenomenon of transfer and notional machines to talk about that. Well, so in math, Let's talk about the concept of numbers. So in math, we have these things called numbers and they have properties. Namely, you know, one, one thing is numbers can be rational, rational numbers. I don't know if anybody here knows Java. Um, if you do know Java, here's a pop quiz. What's one divided by three in Java? If anybody has any guesses, <clears throat> feel free to type it in the chat. So Paul says one divided by three is zero. Do, do other people agree? Josh agrees. Okay, we've got some, some uh, consensus here. Um, <coughs> so yeah, uh, Paul and uh, Lindsay agrees. Yeah, one over three in Java is zero. That's because Java doesn't actually have numbers, yo. Like that's a real problem. So, uh, you know, and of course, those of you who know Java, you're like, right, well, that's because you have to declare things to be like a long or a double or a float. But regardless of what you declare it, there will always be mathematical operations where you go, oh, snap, I should have used a different kind of number. Because numbers in Java don't behave like numbers in math. And so this notional machine of getting kids comfortable with numbers cannot be constructed using languages like this. And surprise, the same problem exists in things like Scratch or Python or or you know, dozens of other popular languages, JavaScript. So that's kind of a problem. Let's talk about, um, I don't know, variables, right? So math has variables and in math, variables can never be mutated, right? That's like an important quality um, in math. But in Python, of course, I can write X equals X plus one and mutate the value of X once again. If our, if our goal is transfer, right, computational thinking, well, then we should have the same behaviors. We should be able to construct a notional machine in Python for variables that kids can then apply when they see variables in math. The problem is that notional machine isn't right. In fact, if a kid joins my math class and says, I know what a variable is, and they write x equals x plus one on the board, man, that's like instant IEP for that kid. <laughs> You know, like, dear God, please stop teaching programming if you care about kids' math scores, right? I mean, this is, you know, this is a problem. Um, and of course, when we get into things like um, functions, right, we all know that uh, some of you may remember the vertical line test, right? If it, if it fails the vertical line test, it's not a function. So if I, if I say, you know, if I, if I call a function with the same input 10 times, I had better get the same output 10 times. <laughs> but what about JavaScript? right? I can, I can make a counter. And every time I call the function, it prints out a different counter, right? Each time I click a button, I get a higher number back. Well, wait a second. That's not good. I guess functions aren't functions either. And again, the same is true in many programming languages. So look, my point here is not to poo-poo programming. My point is to really illustrate that if transfer is this hard, none of us should be surprised 
that in the 62 years since Papert said so, almost nobody has ever successfully taught math using programming, right? Like the research on this, uh, especially on algebra, is really sad. So if we want to jump on the integration bandwagon, we're going to need a whole lot more than blind enthusiasm. So um, again, this is not actually a talk about Bootstrap. If you want to look at our research, it's all on our website. I'll post the link at the end. But I'll cut to the chase and say, we've actually you know, managed to see some real outcomes, um, positive math outcomes from learning programming. But it's a very specific kind of programming taught in a very specific way. So my goal here is not to sell you on Bootstrap and, and sell you on what we do, but it's rather to give away, give away our recipe for what we do so that you can do it too. So if you are a curriculum writer or a curriculum consumer as a teacher, here are some do's and don'ts. So first, start with your learning goals. And if I recall correctly, you know, uh, Paul talked about this, Rachel talked about this, Elder talked about this. So kudos to all of you. Um, start with your learning goals. Um, and yes, absolutely, I will, um, here I can paste the link into the chat right now, Paul. Oh, perfect, Joe's gonna submit it, great. Um, so if you wanna integrate into something like history or social studies, first you have to find out what do those classes wanna teach? What are their goals? Second, which of those goals are painful? I, I can't tell you how many times I see CS people screw this up. They take a learning goal that a history teacher already nails, right? Like that teacher has a great project. They have no problem teaching this learning goal. And the CS person says, wouldn't it be cool to do it with code? And like, even if the answer to that question is yes, why would that teacher ever use your stuff, right? You're not, you're not addressing a problem they have. So they'll just smile nicely and back away slowly. So we need to identify the pain. What is difficult for a history or social studies teacher or a math teacher or a biology teacher? Until you can articulate that, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Okay, once you've identified the pain points, then you ask, can computing address those same goals? And if they can, and by the way, most of the time the answer is no, but if the answer is yes, the next question is, can it do it in less time and or with less pain? Because look, maybe teaching physics with Python or JavaScript is a great idea, right? Maybe so. But if it takes an extra week to teach the damn JavaScript before you can teach the concept you wanted to teach, well, game over, right? A physics teacher is not gonna bother. Um, and then finally, can you address those goals better than you could without the computing? So this is a really high bar. Not only do you have to address a pain point in the same or less time <clears throat> with the same or less pain, but you also, even if you can do it, ultimately kids have to learn those original concepts better than they would have without it. Because if all you've done is no harm, like if the learning outcomes are the same, well, we failed. And we don't get to congratulate ourselves by saying, aha, but at least they learned coding because a biology teacher's job is not to teach them coding. And so if all we've done is no harm, the biology teacher has no reason to use our stuff. So you actually have to get better outcomes. Okay. So a next set of do's, choose your tools carefully. So this gets back to the math example, right? Don't just say use Java, use code.org. Don't just say use Bootstrap, right? You should be able to articulate why the tool you've chosen is the best tool for those goals. If you can't, if, if you're like, oh, it's free, it's easy, it's fun. None of those are good answers, none of them. I wanna know if I'm a, if I'm a physics teacher, why is your tool the best tool for physics? And if you haven't thought about it yet, well, to start thinking about it. Second, you want to ask, is this tool appropriate for an educational context, right? I'll tell you right now, R is a beautiful language for data science. It's a fantastic language, but it has some challenges in an educational context. So what do I mean by that? What makes a tool good for learning? Well, it needs to have good error messages. So many tools, so many programming languages, the errors are god awful. And as teachers, we know that mistakes should be opportunities for learning. But if a mistake instead is error on line 265, array index out of bounds, well, then it's not an opportunity for learning. And that's, that makes kids, that disempowers kids. 
<clears throat> and I should add from an equity angle, look, I'm a white boy. And so if I get a crappy error message, it's frustrating for me, but it doesn't ruin my day. Because if I look around in, in like the media, there's lots of, of people who look like me and use the same bathroom as me who are programmers. So like I'm frustrated, but I'll deal with it. But for an underrepresented student, an inscrutable error message is, you know, much more damaging, right? There's a tendency to not raise your hand, right? I don't want to be the one girl in my class who, who gets this error message, even though the boys are getting it too. Um, so bad error messages are just bad in general, but they're particularly bad when it comes to equity. Um, does, the, does your tool rely on typing? If so, that could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on the age of the students. Does it have really complex syntax? Again, depending on the age of the students, that can be a mild speed bump or Mount Everest. And finally, how much time do you need to actually teach kids that tool? Like I said, if you're trying to get a social studies teacher to use Scratch, make sure you've accounted for how many hours of not history they have to spend just getting kids to use Scratch. Because whatever that number of hours is, you have stolen it from them and you have to pay it back. Okay, here's some don'ts. This goes especially for those of you who write curriculum. Don't write a computing curriculum if you want to teach computing. I know that seems counterintuitive, but that's pretty important. If the mindset we have is that teaching computing is good, well then we're just gonna blindly start writing computing materials. Look, teaching computing is good, but the host discipline, the teacher we're working with, they haven't necessarily bought into that, nor should they, that's not their job. So focus on writing the best darn chemistry curriculum you can that happens to use computing. You know, ask, does your curriculum fit with the scope and sequence? You might have a brilliant idea that is genuinely awesome, but you're introducing concepts completely out of order from what the scope and sequence that teacher has to follow, use. And so right there, it's a non-starter. You've written yourself out of that classroom. Does your curriculum truly address the standards? Dear God, I can't tell you how many lame computing and math curricula I have seen where people are like, look, they're writing this cool function for this video game, but they're using the distance formula and therefore they're learning the distance formula. No, using a thing is not the same as learning a thing. So does it truly address the standards that that teacher has in front of them? That's a challenging question and you need to know what those standards are. I'm sure all of us have been to PDs where a computer science person gets an honest question. Hey, which standards do you have? How do you assess them? What are your rubrics? And the, the, the PD, person running the PD says, well, you're the teacher, you're the expert there. I think that is a cop-out. I think that's a toxic cop-out. I think any of us that are brave enough to stand in front of a room full of non-CS teachers and tell them to use CS, it is our job to know their standards and to be able to explain which of them we address and which ones we don't. Do we use similar activities, right? Are these activities that you know a mainstream teacher might be familiar with and we're just tweaking them a little to make them computational? And here's, here's a big one. Does your curriculum or activities, can they be assessed using the existing assessments? If I'm writing something for a social studies class and my assessment includes for loops, I'm probably doing something wrong because I don't think they teach for loops in a history class. I need to be using their quizzes to see if my stuff worked. And then if you can, and this is, this is sort of the gold standard, see if those students perform better than a control loop. Um, in addition to computing, there's also pedagogy. So please do not, here, let me pull this up here. Um, do not blindly enforce your pedagogy. Um, are, are any of you familiar with uh, the term pedagogical content knowledge? Um, just to give you a quick, uh, uh, an idea, um, you can be a brilliant mathematician and a crappy math teacher. You can also be a great teacher, but not a good math teacher. And what that suggests is that there is something, there's like a Venn diagram, there's something in between the intersection of knowing math and being a great teacher. And inside that intersection is good pedagogy for math content. And pe there's pedagogical content knowledge in every subject and we have to respect it. So in computer science, it's really common 
for us to say, you know what's the best practice? Giving kids a challenging problem and then just letting them go wild, right? Not giving them structure, just being like, see what you can do. Now, whether you agree with that or not, I will just say that's common practice in CS. And often when a CS person tries to plug computing into some other subject, they take their pedagogy with them. That rubs those teachers the wrong way. So we need to know, if you're gonna stand in front of a room full of social studies teachers, what are social studies best practices? Can you name them? Can you talk about the pros and cons? Does your approach use them and how? And if there are places where you break with that, that's fine, but you need to know enough to explain why. So all of these are pretty high bars, but that's what you need to do if you really want to take integration seriously. If we have any administrators on the call, I'll just say this, trust your teachers, right? There are plenty of biology teachers who don't know enough math, enough computer science to explain why it feels wrong, but it doesn't feel right to them. Trust them. Have them talk to each other. Have them develop their own vocabulary for their concerns. If you put enough math teachers into a programming PD, eventually they will arrive on, oh, that's why I don't like it. It doesn't have functions. They don't obey the vertical line test, but they need that time and space to do so. Asking, rather than telling the teacher, oh, you're just afraid of something new. Don't worry, you can do it. Rather than, oh, you're uncomfortable, my hands are off. Instead, say, I hear that you're uncomfortable. Can you say why? Can you, can you try to vocalize what about this is, is rubbing you the wrong way? Because if I, as your administrator, understand that, well, then maybe the next time I bring someone in to talk to you, I'll have a better sense for what I should be looking for to address those concerns. And then finally, once you've actually you know, pulled the trigger and you've decided to integrate computing into a class, don't expect that teacher to nail it on the first try. Anything worth doing has a learning curve. So stick with implementation over time. Give them a roadmap. Let them know. We're going to stick with this for the next two to three years. And that it's okay to dip their toe in the water in the first year to just get comfortable. So <clears throat> I wanted to leave you all with an example, a concrete example. So speaking of buzzwords, uh, data science is like the new hotness, right? Everyone's talking about data science. Yay, data science. And you know, in true unconference fashion, uh, I was notified 24 hours ago that really we, we, you wanna hear about social studies and history. So that's what I'm gonna do. So first of all, um, I wanna give you a sense for what data science is in K-12, because I think the term is often poorly defined. Um, the loudest voices in the room tend to say, oh, data science, that's like a mix of statistics and computing, right? That's, those are the ingredients. As long as you do a little bit of both, you're in good shape. Well, I would argue that that is an incorrect and irresponsible framing of data science. So just very briefly, I'll say there's two more ingredients that people need to consider, especially in K-12. So one of them is what I would call civic responsibility. Um, if you're thinking of data science as just stats plus coding, well then, great, you'll teach kids the value of a good random sample and you'll move on because that's what statistics dictates. But we know from like the news that if you, get, if, you build a, uh, if you train an AI, right, you build a data model based on a random sample taken from a society filled with bias, guess what? Your model is biased too. I don't know if any of you heard Microsoft a couple years ago had this chatbot that had been trained on like a corpus of text from across the internet. And they said, it's gonna behave just like a 13-year-old girl. And in 24 hours, their chatbot was spitting out all this anti-Semitic nonsense. Um, and so a data science teacher needs to go beyond teaching stats and computing. They need to point out, look, there's ethical implications if you take a random sample from a biased society. How do we address those? Um, so that's, that's an, a key ingredient for data science, not to mention the importance of how data is manipulated and used and reported on. And those of you who are history or social studies teachers, you can sort of see where I'm going with this. Um, don't worry, I'll get a little deeper in a moment. The other ingredient is domain investment. Again, if you're teaching, if you think of data science as stats and computing, well, then it doesn't matter what your data set is about, right? You can do linear regression on any scatter plot you want. But when that's all you think data science is, you forget the, the importance of a data set that matters to kids, a data set that's accessible, approachable, and engaging. You could be the world's greatest data scientist, but if you don't understand baseball at all, you will never be a data analyst for the Brewers. 
um, you know, you, you need to know the domain. And that has profound implications for everything from equity to engagement. So with that framing in mind, what does this mean for history and social studies? Well, first of all, you know, people who say it's just stats and computing, good luck convincing a social studies teacher to spend a lot of time on either of those. Neither of them are in the scope and sequence for a social studies teacher. So right away, it's a non-starter. But once you start thinking about the connections to civic responsibility, and you think about the importance of domain knowledge, well, then you can start coming up with some good ideas. And I wanna share with you what we, uh, what we do in Bootstrap Data Science. Um, so we have social studies materials that we've developed for multiple age groups. So at the elementary school level, thanks to a grant from the Robin Hood Foundation, we've partnered with the KIPP Charter School Network to pilot materials aimed at elementary school history and social studies. And we have um, multiple units on, on everything from Mayan civilization to food habits over time to you know uh, shipwrecks from, from long ago, all these different topics. These topics are taken directly from the scope and sequence of fifth grade social studies and history. And in those units, the way that a history teacher traditionally introduces them is, you know, let's read the narrative in the book. And if you don't believe me, look, here's a chart, a table, or a graph. Seriously, if you haven't looked through a modern social studies or history book, you should. There's data everywhere. But the focus is on the narrative. What we did is flip that. So kids actually start with data. And they have to think about, well, what story does this data tell? Now, the tool we use at the elementary school level is spreadsheets. Right? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to waste your time on it, but I'll just say we thought really carefully about why we think that that's the right tool for that age group. And as far as data science learning goals, we're dealing with visualization. So students start learning how to display data, to look for patterns in data. And from a history teacher's perspective, it's not a heavy lift to get a kid to make a pie chart from a spreadsheet. Right? Like you can basically teach that. You can teach pie charts and bar charts, for example, in one class period. And if it's done in the context of answering content focused questions, like, you know, what kind of what kinds of foods were most prevalent during a particular time period? Well, it fits. It already fits in line with what you're trying to do. So in our elementary school units, kids look at the data and they try to come up with the narrative. And of course, there's disagreement. Right. You might have two different kids in the same room saying, I think the data tells me story A. The other kid says, no, no, it tells me story B. And this is a great opportunity for teachers to have those kids argue. Well, who's right? How can we tell? And those questions immediately refocus things back on the data. Kids say, well, you know, I think uh, people were eating more sheep because there were more sheep bones retrieved from this particular um, colonial site. And another kid says, well, no, how do you know they were eating those sheep? Maybe those sheep were doing some, maybe they were growing them for wool. So you can't trust that data to tell you about food. And so they're getting really into the nitty gritty of deep questions in data science, but all of it is focused on content. And by the time the students are ready to read the book, they're incredibly engaged, right? Because they wanna know, well, what does the book say? What story does the data tell us according to the book? Um, in middle school, we, use, we have two different tools that we use. We offer CodeApp for kids who are not ready for text-based programming. And kids can look at you know, trends in immigration, academic achievement, how bills become laws, crime, um, and of course, when you start broadening your definition of data science to think about civic responsibility, there's the other ingredient that's left out. You can have conversations about data manipulation and propaganda. So, you know, there's wonderful examples in a U.S. history class of how Stalin worked really hard to manipulate data because Stalin understood that data tells a story and he wanted to control the narrative. There's examples of this taken from Rwanda, from, from you know, uh, World War II Germany. Um, and the data science topics there are visualization, but also you actually can get into some real math that is relevant to the history class. So I'll just give you a classic example. Measures of spread, right? Mean, median, mode. These are often taught in a math class, but without context, they're incredibly dry. In a social studies class, you can, bring, you can do things like ask kids, hey, if the average family income in America is double the poverty line, does that mean that there isn't a lot of poverty? Why would a newspaper you know, use the, 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 the average? Why not the median? 
And for those of you who, who, for whom it may have been a while, I'll just say the mean, the average is highly sensitive to outliers. So the Elon Musk's and Jeff Bezos's of the world are screwing up the mean in our country. And so you can't use the mean to report on income reliably. That is, that is an accurate but completely manipulative statistic. Any report on income should be done using the median because income in this country is skewed. And there are obvious social studies implications for this, right? Is school funding based on property taxes? If so, what is the skew of property taxes and what does that mean for educational achievement? When we talk about crime, right, you can turn on the news. People will show you a graph. I, I, this, was, this was done a couple of weeks ago. There's a graph of violent crime in New York City over the last couple of years, and it's a huge spike. It looks like it's going like all the way up the, the you know, a steep slope. But it turns out when you look at the scale of the graph, it's like a 2% or 1% increase, right? So this is how data is used to manipulate society. This is how bad, bad and misleading data science can be used to get people elected or unelected or to raise funds. And in high school, we use Pirate. We, it's, it, it looks like Python, it acts like math. Um, we've got students analyzing the stop and frisk data set or looking at the Boston housing data to see the long-term impact of redlining, right? And again, we're talking about data manipulation, propaganda. We have students do activities where they actually have to transform and filter their data, so getting more advanced, and then do some critical reading and writing. Because if you listen to the news or you read a newspaper, all the time there, you know, you'll see people making arguments about data, but at the high school, school level and upper middle school level, it is absolutely within a social studies teacher's wheelhouse to assign an essay, write an op-ed response to this article and have the article be something that uses data in a misleading way, right? Or some study, right? I, I love this one. There's this great study that everyone talks about, about how American schools are doing so badly compared to other countries. And it turns out that if you filter your data set and you disaggregate by poverty level, at every level of, of income, American schools do pretty darn well compared to other countries. Our rich kids do better than other countries' rich kids. Our poor kids do better than other countries' poor kids. But when you group them together, it looks like we do terribly because we have so many more poor kids than, most other, than many other industrialized nations. So again, this is a social studies concept and the statistics concept embedded there, for those of you who don't know, is called Simpson's Paradox. But I don't care about stats. As a history teacher, I wanna point out the ways that grouping and, and aggregating data can be used to manipulate society. So all of this is right in the wheelhouse of a social studies teacher. And all these materials, by the way, are freely available on the web. Um, our elementary school materials will be available next year. Right now, um, we're wrapping up the pilot. Um, but my point is, you know, there are ways to do integration that require being humble about computer science, that recognize that the t a tool is nothing more than a tool and it needs to be aligned to the content area, that programming activities might be fun, but they need to be social studies activities or whatever your host discipline is. And you want to make sure that you're embodying the pedagogy of that discipline. And sometimes, if it's a, especially if it's a non-STEM discipline, recognizing that, you know, computing has a lot of reading and writing involved. And it's not a cop-out to ask students to think critically about code they've written or analysis that they've performed. And that's the end of my talk. So I've got plenty of time for questions. I hope that wasn't too boring. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll leave a link up here for those of you that are curious. So all of our materials are freely available online. We offer PD. We work with schools in 49 states. Uh, West Virginia, we're still coming for you. Um, and you've also got my email address if you want to get in touch. So I'll leave the floor open. Uh, Emmanuel, if, if you if you could, maybe you could uh, go ahead and post your uh, a link to your slides. That way, you know, if if anybody really wants to get them real quickly, because I don't, I don't know how soon we can get them out to uh, through the CSTA. You got it. Yeah, stand by it and just make sure that it's uh, publicly readable. <laughs> and while I'm doing that, folks, feel, please feel free to yeah. post some questions. Okay, anybody with the link, copy. <coughs> All 
Okay, that ought to work. Terrific. Thank um, you very much. And uh, and I should add for those I'm I'm old, so I always forget to talk about social media. But if if you like what you just heard and you want to like share it with the world and say, hey, check them out. Here is our uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram handle. And I'm sure at some point we'll probably get a TikTok. Emmanuel, since uh, since there's no other questions in the chat, um, uh, uh, let me ask you one that you may yeah. not want to answer or whatever. Earlier, uh, early in your talk, you, you mentioned um, that there were uh, uh, the uh, NSF recommends uh, three, uh, mm -hmm. I guess, middle school programs or to, you know to integrate CS into other domains. Um, would would you care to? Uh, uh, you know, the other, the other two. The other, so so I, I, I want to make sure I'm, I'm choosing my words really carefully because I, I don't want to send the wrong impression. It's not, it's, it's not that the NSF is like specifically recommending only these three programs. Okay. Um, it's just that when, when people are writing proposals saying, oh, you know, we want money to develop a new curriculum for middle and high school. Um, you know, there's some question of, look, we, there's already a bunch of, you know, carefully developed evidence-based scale tested programs. Here are the three. Please explain why you want to develop a new one. So it's I, the NSF does, is not endorsing these three programs, um, and so I believe it's uh, Bootstrap, Exploring Computer Science, and APCS Principles. Oh, okay. Terrific. Thank you. Thank but yeah, you. please don't. Please don't. Yeah, nobody leave here saying the N Emmanuel told us that the NSF <laughs> recommends Bootstrap. Nope, that's not. I will get in big trouble. Jeff Forbes will come and, and kick my butt. Yeah, yeah, he, he will. He will. Yes. Any other questions? Kate says, how would you advise helping or guiding non-CS teachers to prepare to give students feedback when doing a CS integrated lesson or activity? That's a great question, Kate. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, um, I think you might find this a slightly non-satisfying answer. And if you do, please push back. Okay, so here's my answer. Um, the design of the activity should be such that those teachers already know how to give feedback on at least the, the subject content portion of it. So if you want kids to be doing like a, a scratch animation um, instead of a book report for a story they read, okay? that te the, the English teacher should know how to evaluate that animation to determine if a student really got the themes of the book. And, and again, they're not commenting on the code at all. Um, but if you've designed the activity well as an integrated activity, then at least the content knowledge part of it, that teacher should already know how. And if they don't know how, I don't want to help them know how, I want to redesign my activity. Um, it's not their job to, to teach programming. Um, so, you know, as far as guiding them, I mean, if we're guide, like, if we're guiding them to give feedback, like, oh, you used a while loop when you should have used a for loop. I mean, is that, Kate, is that what you're talking about? Like, how do we help them talk about the computer science side of things? Kate, you can come online if you'd like. I mean. Well, I'll, I'll let Kate get back to us. Um, but, oh, here she is, I think. Oh, good. Hi, can you hey, hear me? Hey, Kate. Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, thanks. I, no, I, I, um, I just noticed that mm teachers are hesitant to give feedback when they feel they're doing something new or innovative that they're not an mm. expert in. Um, yeah. So it's not really feedback on for loops or while loops. It's really empowering them to give feedback. Yeah. That is actually there in their wheelhouse, but because it's Got like it. an integrated content area, sometimes teachers feel like they don't have the self-efficacy to give nice. the feedback they would normally give. So what that's, do you do to empower them and remind them that you know you you can do it that that kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, okay, that, that's super helpful. I, I can give you a much more satisfying answer. Then um, I would say first find out what their assessment or rubric is for the non-CS version of that same activity. 
So start with that, right? Be like, look, here's a here's a good book report, here's a bad book report. You already know, you know, here's your rubric. I like ask them, like, give me your rubric. And then say, okay, cool. Here's how it applies. Then I would generate an example, like a really good um, computing version of that same project and a really bad computing version of that project, right? So give them, give like define your define your extremes on the scale, and work and and sit down for a minute and talk with that teacher and say, you know, I'm not going to tell you which one of these is good and which one of these is bad. I want you to tell me. And if that teacher start is like, oh yeah, oh no, this one really does suck. Like I know my rubric. This one is terrible. You can be like, yes, exactly. Like you already know how to use the rubric you have on this new integrated thing you haven't seen before. And that'll give them a lot of confidence. I think the majority of, of, of teacher hesitation is confidence. And so we need to be willing to provide, you know, an, an A plus example and a D minus example um, and, and engage them in picking which is which and why. Is that helpful, Kate? Does that help define things a little better? <clears throat> cool. Okay, Rachel asks, what would you suggest to CS teachers trying to recruit other content areas to collaborate? Um, great question. My answer is start with, hey guys, what sucks for you? <laughs> Seriously, find out what they are complaining about. Other teachers are just as busy as we are and potentially busier. Um, so we're not gonna seduce them by being like, I want to do something cool. Wouldn't you like to do something cool? I'm like, yeah, of course I want to do something cool, like sleep. Um, you know, find out what sucks for them and then come back and say, I've got an idea for something that might make it suck less, right? Maybe I could, maybe in your social studies class, you know, you can do a project on stop and frisk or immigration or, you know, whatever, or, co you know, or in your biology class, you want to do a project on COVID data. I will teach the data visualization in my CS class, and we can do a joint project, and you can teach, you know, teach that better than you would before. Um, one more quick example, Rachel. Um, algebra two teachers always have to teach exponentiation, and it's always a dry topic. Like exponential growth often is a very boring topic for math teachers and math students. Holy cow! Look at the spread of any disease; it's always exponential. And COVID is a pretty darn relevant thing that's top of mind for kids. If you tell that teacher that you will teach kids how to do scatter plots in, you know, whatever tool you think is best for COVID data as a vehicle for introducing exponential growth, I think that's a chance to make exponentiation suck less in a math class. Um, uh, Emmanuel, we're a little over time, but oh, I'm you, sorry. Okay. Can, no, no, no. Can, can you can you deal with uh, uh, as a last question, Paul's question? Paul, Paul's what are some question. of the ways you've seen CS integration help students learn content in their areas with less pain? Yes, totally. Well, so uh, believe it or not, Paul, there are some programming languages out there that have numbers. I know that sounds insane. It sounds too good to be true, but they really do. They even have variables. And get this, you're not going to believe it. They have functions. And guess what? Learning to program in those languages using word classic math word problems as the programming assignment definitely seems like well, those like actual data we've published on kids taking away a deeper understanding of functions and variables than they had before. And so that concept, and by the way, word problems are always painful for math teachers. So if you can make word problems less painful because the end result for kids is like, oh, I, I built something, I solved it, right? I, and I typed it and it works as opposed to, I wrote it on paper, hey teacher, can you tell me if I'm right or not? Like that gives them a sense of concreteness. And if the language itself, if the semantics of the language help them build a notional machine where it's like, oh, vertical line test. I know, got it. Okay, cool. You know, then you really do have successful transfer. Um, so that's, that's since I'm over time, that's the one example I will give you, but there are many more I could. You all have my email address. You all have uh, our Twitter handle. Please feel free. Um, our, our advertising budget is zero. So if you liked what you saw, please feel free to tweet and just say, hey, this bootstrap thing like seems good. Um, it was really nice working with all of you, and uh, I hope this was enjoyable and helpful. Thank you. And thanks very, to, very to Joe for <laughs> Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Uh, and and by the way, Kate is doing a session, uh, the next anchor session, 
uh, on AI integration with uh, within uh, uh, elementary. So th this this is this might be a, a really a nice thing for you you guys that are on this session to hear to hear. So uh, thank thank you again, Emmanuel. And uh, it's my pleasure. I guess we go to the uh, breakout sessions or whatever. Thank you. Thank you again. Sounds good. Bye, everybody.